Hello you guys, welcome to my channel. Thank you so much for being here. You might recognize me from TikTok. I, I do a little bit of true crime over there. But here I am on YouTube finally. It's been a long time coming, but I'm finally here. I'm finally doing it. So let's get right into it. Today we're going to be talking about Peter Woodcock. He is Canada's youngest serial killer and between the months of September of 1956 to January of 1957, he murdered three children. He would later change his name to David Michael Kruger in 1982, I believe. But during this, I will be calling him Peter Woodcock. That is the name he was born with. Um, I think he changed it, he changed it for narcissistic reasons, obviously, and it was paid for by the government because he has been institutionalized, or excuse me, he was institutionalized for his entire natural born, almost his entire natural born life. Uh, I did a ton of research for this case. I read two really amazing books. I highly suggest you look into those. They provide a ton of really amazing information. Um, just about not only the subjects of the book, but the lawyers, the policemen. It's fascinating how something like this could even happen. And especially in Canada, our own backyard, Toronto, Ontario. So I first want to put a warning onto this video. Uh, viewer discretion is strongly advised. There is talk about obviously murder, but children are involved and uh, children are essayed and it's just, it's really heavy stuff. So viewer discretion is advised. So Peter Woodcock is Canada's youngest serial killer. He was known as the, he was dubbed as the serial killer they could not cure. And between September 1956 and January 1957, he murdered three children, and he was only 17 years old at the time. He would spend almost his entire life institutionalized, and on his very first day out in 35 years on a day pass, he murdered again. So we're going to start right at the beginning. Peter Woodcock was born March 5th, 1939 to a teen mom, either 17 or 19, depending on which report you read. Um, she kept Peter for one month and then he was given over to the Children's Aid Society. So for whatever reason, the Children's Aid Society didn't want Peter to bond with anybody. So he was bounced around from foster home to foster home. It didn't help that he was just a very odd child to begin with. He never stopped crying. He never ate. He didn't sleep. He would scream if somebody got too physically close to him. And he was just, he was just an odd kid. And so I think it was really easy to bounce him around foster home to foster home because he was just unwanted. Peter didn't start speaking until almost two years old. And when he did talk, it was incoherent and almost shrill shrieking noises. So being bounced around from foster home to foster home, Peter not only experienced neglect, but abuse as well. Although it's not well documented, one of the only incidences of abuse documented is when he was two year old, he went into the emergency room with a twisted neck and that required surgery. Now, I wasn't there or anything, but I'm going to assume this was not the first or the last incident of abuse. It was also a neck injury. Did he end up having a head injury at one point? Was there head trauma? Um, lots of serial killers have prefrontal cortex injuries or acquired brain injuries or whatever. So could Peter have at one point suffered head trauma is what I'm wondering. Many serial killers are known to have prefrontal cortex damage and that's the part of the brain that controls reasoning and control and problem solving, things like that. I actually have it up right here, a whole list. Yeah, like look at this, lots of, lots of serial killers you even know. John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, David Berkowitz, that's son of Sam, uh, Ed Gain, 
Jesus. Yeah. Alexander Pashuskin, the chessboard killer. There's the BTK killer. Oh, there's, there's a ton of them. I'll link it below. So at the age of three, Peter was placed into the home of Susan and Frank Maynard. They were an upper middle class family, and they often took in orphans and waifs throughout World War I. It's unknown why they wanted to keep Peter. Uh, there's no record of them ever wanting to re return him or give him back, and they had many opportunities to. Um, it would be said that the Maynards just felt bad for him, and his mother actually ended up saying at one point, if anybody needed love, it was him. His foster mother, of course. So Susan Maynard did work very closely with Peter. She knew something was wrong, and she worked meticulously to get him as much help as she could. At the age of seven, Susan would take Peter to the hospital for sick children for his behavioral problems, and he would be treated there for five years. Peter was unfortunately a natural target for bullies, and he had no friends. He didn't like to do anything that other kids his age liked to do, and he was always alone. A social worker would once take Peter to the Canadian National Exhibition, which is ironically foreshadowing, but you'll figure that out later. Uh, the social worker would report that Peter looked at a, all the children running around and said that he, and I quote, wishes a bomb would fall and kill all of the children. So that was, that was the kind of child Peter was. Peter was also a wanderer. From a very, very young age, he wandered all throughout this city. He loved to ride the streetcars all day and sometimes all night. Sometimes he wouldn't come home, putting his parents into an obvious, you know, worry. So Peter would ride streetcars and trains all over Toronto and he got very, very familiar with the city. He, he knew it up and down. Peter remembers he got lost for the first time at the age of four. He doesn't quite remember how he got home, but he thinks just a good Samaritan would have gave him a nickel for a payphone or helped him get home or something like that. But that never stopped. He constantly wandered. Peter was not only obsessed with riding the streetcars all around the city, but he was obsessed with the streetcar and train schedules. He would memorize them and make sure they were on time. As Peter got older, his weirdness did not go away, and Susan Maynard actually feared he would burn the house down. Peter would cut his clothing into small pieces and carve things into the kitchen table. He would rip the blinds off of the windows, and he smashed his radio at one point. Susan also had an inkling that the sudden death of her canary was also the responsibility of Peter. It's said that she left the house very briefly for about 20 minutes, and when she came home, her canary was laying on the piano on its back, surrounded by candles. Peter blamed the dog, but... Oh. It seemed that Peter had little to no self-control. Susan once told somebody at the Children's Aid Society that Peter would... She thinks Peter would do better if they formally adopted him, and she was advised against this why like it's obvious that the kid was a l like strange not a little strange he was quite strange but if the woman was willing to put the work in and she obviously was why not let the boy know that he was loved officially but regardless even though he was actually i don't know if it's a ward of the state in canada but he belonged to the Children's Aid Society, but Peter's parents paid a lot of money for his private schooling. They paid a lot of money for his private schooling and for all of the, you know, doctors and testing that they got done because they knew something was wrong and they tried really hard. So Peter, of course, did not do well in public school, so he was sent to Waycroft Private School, where he also did not do well. Like I said, he was just, he was a natural target for bullies. He, he was a magnet for them. In 1950, when Peter was 11 years old, he was being considered for the Sunnyside Children's Center in Kingston, Ontario, and it was a school for disturbed children. He would be sent there and he would describe his time at Sunnyside as the best years of his life. When Peter was 14 years old, the school wanted to release him, which was totally normal at the time, but he was absolutely not ready. Peter was still as strange as they came and kind of lived in a fantasy world. 
Peter had this imaginary group of boys that he led that he called the Winchester Heights Gang. It was a group of 500 invisible but obedient boys. This would make Peter feel powerful and like he had control over something. Like any kid, Peter thought a lot about sex, but in my opinion, he was hypersexual. At 13, when Peter was at Sunnyside, he would be caught by the superintendent having consenting sex with a 12-year-old girl. In 1954, Peter would be released, sent home, and back to Waycroft. This was a huge mistake. Peter would spend one year at Waycroft and then transfer to Lawrence Park Collegiate. He would spend six miserable weeks at Lawrence Park and wanted out. And then a couple weeks after that, Peter started at Bloordale College School and would stay there from grades 9 to 11. When Peter returned from Kingston, he got this beautiful red and white bicycle. With his love of wandering, Peter began to ride all over Toronto, getting even more familiar with the side streets and the back streets that you can't access by car. On weekends, Peter would cover between 50 and 60 miles, which is 80 to 96 kilometers. That's a lot. That's a distance. In February of 1956, Peter started to develop new interests, including small children and human anatomy. He would fantasize about killing young kids and dissecting them. Peter started molesting children and engaging them in sex games, bribing them with rides on his beautiful bicycle. Peter would begin to get more violent with these attacks as time went on. He would not only molest these children, but he would choke them until they were unconscious, leave them to wake up usually naked, alone, and scared. June of 1956 would be the first recorded incident Peter Woodcock was involved in. It wasn't recorded well, but it was recorded. It was recorded in a notebook, and we'll come back to that. In one of Peter's wandering adventures, he would meet a 10-year-old girl who he would say wanted to die and was grateful when he offered to kill her. This poor girl came from a troubled family life. Her parents were divorcing, but her mother blamed her because her father was abusing her at night in her bed. So that's that. Blame the 10-year-old. Good stuff. So the pair talked for weeks leading up to the incident, and they even made a plan. Peter would take her to the Don Valley, but between dawdling and not knowing the area as well as he thought he did, he, he couldn't go through with the plan. He had planned on killing and dissecting this little girl. A full anatomy lesson, as he put it. Meanwhile, this girl's parents thought she had been kidnapped and notified police. With it getting dark, the pair abandoned their plan and walked to a payphone where this girl called her parents, told her, no, I haven't been kidnapped, told them where they were, and the police came. When the cops arrived, there she was with a strange older boy. Nothing really came of this except for the cops taking Peter home. This threw Peter's mother into a rage. Not only did the cops take her home, but there was a cop car outside of her house and she did not like that at all. Nothing really came of it, like I said. Peter's parents gave him a good talking to. He threatened to kill himself, but it was, it was pretty, uh, in my opinion, he was like, why don't I just go and kill myself? And then his parents were like, followed him into his bedroom. So other than angering his parents and upsetting his mother quite a bit, all that came of this was his name and address being jotted down in a notebook and his father telling him, don't pick up any more kids. On September 15th, 1956, Peter Woodcock would commit his first murder. Seven-year-old Wayne Millette had traveled from Seeley's Bay, Ontario to Toronto, Ontario with his family to see his maternal grandmother. The family arrived, exchanged pleasantries, all that good stuff. Two of Wayne's older brothers went to a movie, and he played out in the front yard of his grandmother's house. As it grew darker, Wayne disappeared. His mother was a little bit worried and called the police for the first time at 8.15. Wayne's father tried to calm his mother down and say, like, he's probably at the movies with his brothers. He'll be home. 
When he did not arrive home with his brothers, Wayne's mother called the police again, and a search would commence after that. Wayne's body was found at 2.30 a.m. on the Canadian National Exhibition Ground. Wayne had been suffocated. His clothes had been taken off and put back on. There were scratches all over his body and bite marks on his thighs. There had been garbage stuffed into his mouth, and the perpetrator took a bowel movement right beside the body. It was said that when they found him, there were still tears visible on his cheeks. Wayne's father identified him. He was sent for an autopsy, and they placed the time of death at around 9 p.m. Wayne had wandered onto the Canadian National Exhibition Grounds, presumably to watch the trains, where he was met with a boy on a bicycle who also shared a love of trains. Witnesses place Wayne with a skinny youth on a bicycle around 15 years old. At about 9 p.m. that same night, a CNE watchman stopped to talk to a strange youth on a bicycle. This youth questioned the guard on whether he or anybody else had ever found a body in the bushes and what they would do if they did. The guard asked the boy if he had seen any bodies, and the boy replied with no, he hadn't. But he did see a boy that looked just like him running from the bushes, a perfect double. And after that, the boy rode away on his bicycle. So not only did witnesses place a youth at the scene, but medical evidence would also point toward a young offender. The marks found on Wayne's throat were too small to belong to an adult's hand, as well as the bite marks. A description of the suspect was released. Dark hair, wore thick glasses, about 5'6", between 14 and 16 years old, pimply complexion, and rode a bicycle. This description was sent out to all of the schools, but only public, not private. Police were desperate to find this killer. They would interview anybody that matched the description and even people that didn't. Police looked into reported runaways between 14 and 18 years old, thinking that this killer had gone into hiding. And this is where we enter 14-year-old Ron Moffat. 14-year-old Ronald Moffat lived at 39 Vinali Street with his parents and two younger brothers. Ron's home life was a little bit rocky. His parents drank and they were kind of on and off. They would split up sometimes and he would go live with either his aunt or his grandmother. Ron started working young, considering the circumstances, you can't really blame him. Just odd jobs, selling newspapers, working at the bowling alley. And when the Canadian National Exhibition came through that year, Ron got a job uh, working a ride. When the CNE left, Ron started school again in grade 7 and went back to his job at the bowling alley. The night of September 15th, 1956, 14-year-old Ron went to a double feature at the Metro Theatre in Toronto. It was two movies followed by a 10-minute cartoon, and it let out just after 9 p.m. He had a friend who was an usher at the theatre, and during these movies, he sat with this friend's girlfriend. After the movie, he would help change the lettering on the marquee and went to his friend's house to sleep. Ron went home Sunday morning, went to school Monday morning like he always did, but opted to skip the afternoon. Tuesday, September 18th, uh, Ron got up at 5.30 a.m. as he always did, and his dad was already up and angry. He had found out Ron skipped school and told him that they would talk later. Ron was scared. Ron was scared of his dad, so he came up with a plan. It wasn't a good plan, but he came up with a plan to pack some things and run away. In actuality, they lived in an apartment building and he just went down a couple floors and hid in a closet. He was just floors beneath his parents, but he didn't come home for four days. He would sleep all day, go to work from 4 to 11 at the bowling alley, and eat in restaurants. So unfortunately, Ron had a previous little stint with the police years before. When he was 12, a 16-year-old convinced him into some petty theft. Long story short, Ron got caught and received probation. Between Ron's age, part-time job, runaway status, and history with the law, police zeroed in on him. The police conducted a search of the apartment building just after the interview and located a sleeping Ron in a closet just under a staircase at 12.20 p.m. When they woke Ron up, he thought they were truancy officers because he had run away. 
Mrs. Moffat was not notified that her son had been found. Ron was thrown into a cop car and taken to the station for questioning. 14-year-old Ronald Moffat was coerced and led through a false confession. They kept him for hours offering correct details when Ron got something wrong. So Ron's confession went something like he stole a bike, went to the CNE, where Wayne was, and this little boy started to annoy him and at one point kick him, making Ron angry when he accidentally killed him by suffocating him, moved the body, and ditched the bike in a cluster of trees. Of course, the bike was never found. Police even took Moffat to the scene and walked him through the crime they were so sure he committed. Bet Moffat was finally notified her son had been found at 5 p.m. and was allowed to see him at 6.45, nearly six hours after. There were major differences between this described suspect and Ronald Moffat. Ron was 5'9", didn't wear glasses, and most importantly, he could not ride a bike. Ron had terrible balance. Although multiple witnesses place Ron at the Metro at the time of the murder and even say they changed the letters with him after, his false confession damned him. I don't know why people make false confessions, but it happens all the time, especially juveniles and those who are mentally handicapped. Police often coerce confessions out of people just because they are so sure or they just they are so desperate to find the killer have you ever seen making a murder that's a good example i haven't actually finished that i should but i know that's a good example anyway even though you know witnesses placed him at the metro he doesn't match the description all that stuff they made casts of ron's teeth and said that it matched the bite marks on Wayne's thighs. Through my research with this case, actually, I learned that dental evidence isn't as damning as movies and shows make you think. I always thought that like, oh, you know, they got a dental imprint. They're good. They can, they can match that to anything. I learned that dental evidence is rocky even today. So imagine what it was like in 1956. Ron was found guilty of murdering seven-year-old Wayne Millett and was to undergo psychiatric testing before sentencing. During this time, Ron was given sodium pentothal, also known as truth serum. This is supposed to put the patient in a daze and make them more vulnerable to admit to their crimes. Moffat underwent this testing but was never told his results. Mrs. Moffat would argue that they didn't release the results because they knew he was innocent and didn't want to admit that they were wrong. Ron would spend one month at the Toronto Psychiatric Hospital while he waited for sentencing. While Ron Moffat was being wrongly convicted, Peter Woodcock was out every weekend molesting small kids. Less than a month after his first kill, on October 6th, 1956, Woodcock would strike again. Peter met nine-year-old Gary Morris at the St. Lawrence Market and naturally asked the boy if he wanted to go on a ride on his bicycle. Peter would take Gary to Cherry Beach, which was at the time an overgrown, desolate area known for crime. Peter would choke Gary until he passed out, undress him, examine him, and then viciously attack him. Autopsy reports would show that Gary suffered from a ruptured liver, which in itself could be fatal, but the actual cause of death was asphyxiation, just like Wayne Millette. It appeared Peter had jumped on Gary, like he had taken a running start and landed on him on his knees. There was also bite marks on his neck. With Wayne's murderer behind bars, police did not give the striking similarities between cases a second look. They didn't think they were connected. They even claimed that the bite marks did not match. On New Year's Day of 1957, a report came in of a young girl being choked and sexually assaulted, but did not die. The girl gave the exact same description that they had kept on hearing. Dark hair, thick glasses, pimply face, teenager, on a bike. The family didn't want this girl to have to go through anything else, and they kept her out of the news. On Saturday, January 19, 1957, four-year-old Carol Voice was playing with her friend Johnny on Danforth Avenue while their mothers chatted inside. 
Peter approached the pair and asked them how old they were and if they liked his bicycle. Of course, they both said yes. Peter asked if they'd like to go for a ride, another resounding yes. And at first, Peter was going to take Johnny. He said, okay, let's go. And then at the last second, he said, actually, I'll take you, and pointed at Carol. He walked away holding Carol's hand and pushing his bike with his other hand. A witness would then see Carol riding on Peter's handlebars just one block over. Now, I read two different accounts. I read that Johnny went inside and, like, announced that Carol had gone on a ride with a high school boy. But then in another account I read that Mrs. Voice came outside and was like where's Carol and Johnny said she went for a ride with a high school boy but regardless Mrs. Voice found out her daughter was missing and immediately started frantically looking for her there was a police officer in the area and she said like oh my god I can't find my kid he took her to the police station and Carol was officially reported missing at 4 20 p.m. At 11.09 p.m., police would locate Carol's deceased body in the Rosedale Ravine near the Prince Edward Viaduct in the Don Valley. Peter strangled Carol until she passed out, but this did not kill her. Peter gouged her eyes, undressed her, assaulted her, and then shoved a stick inside of her, officially causing her death by major hemorrhaging. Woodcock then tried to leave the scene with his bike but slipped down the ravine. He got angry and kicked Carol in the head. Witnesses place Peter coming out of this ravine with his bike and he even stopped a University of Toronto professor and told him, if there's a murder down there, they'll try and blame me. They placed Carol's death between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. and they could see two sets of footprints approach the scene and only one set of footprints leave. They also found what appeared to be tire tracks about the size of a bicycle. A massive search effort commenced. Over 2,000 police officers were stopping people on the street, people that matched the description, people that didn't, anyone. They were once again desperate to find this killer. Peter Woodcock, however, was keeping it pretty cool. He frequently visited the police station near his house and was even welcomed there. And the day after he killed Carol, he went and visited the police station. On Sunday, January 20th, four young police officers were getting ready for their night shift and they were discussing the Carol Voice case. Certain details of the case caught the attention of one police officer. He had been one of the officers that attended the case of the little girl wandering around the Don Valley with the odd teenage boy. The four policemen called their sergeant and started leafing through occurrence reports and their notebooks until they found exactly what they were looking for. An entry from June 1956, Peter Woodcock, Lytton Boulevard. On the morning of Monday, January 21st, 1957, two detectives arrested Peter Woodcock at his school. He did not resist. When brought down to the police station and asked about his whereabouts on Saturday, he said almost word for word what he said to George Sinclair at the CNE the night he killed Wayne. He said, yeah, I was there and I saw a boy that looked just like me running from the scene, a perfect double. And the cops were like, oh my God. The police then started looking into non-fatal attacks reported in the area, and the number was in the dozens. On September 19th, a woman reported that her three-year-old son had been playing in the front yard and disappeared, only to reappear hours later with a teen that brought him home, saying that he had found him. The boy was obviously dazed. He had a head injury that lined up with falling backward. He had scratches all over him and bite marks on his stomach. When they asked the boy what had happened, he said that he had seen the older boy's private areas in his toddler words. To me, it's clear sexual assault was absolutely present, But due to the year and the, I don't know, naivety, is that a word? They didn't, when they went to the hospital, they didn't check him for that. He was not examined for sexual assault, and the only evidence of that is what the little boy said. With all of this happening, police are finally linking the murders of Gary and Carol to the murder of Wayne. 
But even with all of this new information coming out, Ron Moffat was still being held for sentencing. Moffat was sentenced to stay at the Ontario School for Boys in Bowmanville, Ontario. But luckily for Moffat, Peter Woodcock's narcissism would end up freeing him. Peter admitted to the murder of Wayne because he didn't like somebody else taking the credit for his work. Peter Woodcock's trial was set to begin April 8, 1957. Before that, Peter would be visited in prison by his lawyer, Ron Moffat's lawyer, and a policeman, just to make sure that he would testify to his guilt in the murder of Wayne. Peter would testify that he was responsible for the death of Wayne Millette, and on April 16th, Ron Moffat was granted a new trial. After being adjourned a couple of times, Ron's new trial was set to start May 13th, on May 13th, he was declared not guilty, and by May 16th, he was free to go. Ron would spend eight months in detention for a crime he didn't do, but he would suffer greatly from anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder for most of his life. The trial continued. Peter Woodcock pled not guilty. On April 9th, Woodcock's confession is read in court, where he admits to killing Carol Voice and molesting dozens of others. Remember, he is only being tried for the murder of Carol Voice. Not Wayne, not Gary, just Carol. The prosecutor brought 50 witnesses to the stand, whereas the defense only brought six, four of which were psychiatrists that testified that Peter had tremendous mental issues. He was downright crazy. On April 11th, 1957, the jury only took two and a half hours to decide that the then 18-year-old Peter Woodcock was not guilty on account of insanity. Peter would be sent to Oak Ridge, a maximum security mental institution in Pentanguishene, Ontario, and he would stay there for a good majority of his life. While committed, Peter would be included in drug testing and psychiatric experiments and new and improved treatments that were supposed to be really good for the mentally ill. Some of these treatments were very strange to me. There was one called the 100 Day Hate Inn. This is where the inmates were forced together in a confined space for a hundred days. The room was completely empty, except for, of course, the inmates and I think cushions that they could sit on. They would sign a contract saying that they are voluntarily entering, but it was up to staff to decide if and when they were let out. The idea behind this was that the inmates would be forced to find their feelings and, more importantly, develop empathy toward one another. It didn't work. The lights were left on consistently, meals were served on paper plates with plastic utensils shoved through a slot in the door. It only took three or four days for the subjects to beg and plead to be let out. The inmates were given drugs of all sorts, uppers and downers, and they were actually responsible to, like, look after each other. It was very weird to me. Why would anybody ever think something like that would work, ever? The first group was 16 inmates, and they stayed in for the entire 100 days. The experiment would be tested three more times. The second and third groups were smaller and would only stay in for 40 days, and the fourth and final group would consist of eight inmates for 50 days. I actually found the, like, here, let me pull it up. I'm going to link it below, and it is, yeah... It's like written, it's a copy, it's like written on a typewriter, and it's presented to the fall meeting of the Ontario Psychiatric Association, October 5th, 1978. And it's their findings of what went on in this 100-day Hayden at Oak Ridge. So, yeah, you can see like all the doctors' names that were mentioned in the books I read. I'm going to link it below, give it a read. But like I said before, this approach absolutely did not work, and not one of the inmates that took part in this experiment ever did better. During his time at Oak Ridge, Peter was, I guess, as well-behaved as a diagnosed psychopath could be. He would engage in homosexual relationships and remained a master manipulator. In the 1970s, Peter would create this brotherhood targeting weaker inmates. He targeted weaker inmates that could be easily convinced. This brotherhood, of course, had all sorts of power, a link to the outside, far-fetched ideas, unattainable things, money, stuff like that. So Peter starts this brotherhood, and of course, the only way to be initiated into this brotherhood is to perform sex acts on who else but Peter. It's 
kind of like a weird cult is what I'm imagining. Or at least he's trying to make a weird cult anyway. By 1985, Peter Woodcock had made no changes. He was just as dangerous as he was the day he arrived at Oak Ridge. However, by this point, he had been institutionalized for 30 years. This is not only a major expense to Canadian taxpayers, but remember, he was found not guilty. People that are found guilty don't even serve that long. There was a serious urge to get Peter Woodcock moved to a medium security facility and get him slowly but surely integrated into society. He had not known anything but being institutionalized. In 1986, it happened. Peter was moved from the maximum security Oak Ridge in Pentanguishene, Ontario, to the medium security facility in St. Thomas, Ontario. Doctors and staff at both facilities strongly advised against this. They would strongly advise against it, but he was transferred anyway. Peter Woodcock would spend weeks at St. Thomas before being shipped back to a maximum security. As soon as he got there, he started to stir the pot. So when Peter got to the medium security facility, he immediately asked for department store catalogs, which, you know, to the staff that didn't know him is no big deal. But the staff that do know him would know that he would turn right to the children's clothing department section. And that is like pornography to people like him. As soon as he arrived to St. Thomas, he would revive the Brotherhood and come up with a big plan to escape. And in this plan of escaping, he would take staff hostages. So of course, word travels fast and it got back to staff and Peter Woodcock was thankfully yanked out of St. Thomas and put right back into Oak Ridge. Peter would spend the next three years at Oak Ridge only to be transferred again. In 1988, a new psychiatrist saw Peter for the first time, and another rehabilitation attempt began. The board seemed to think that a medium security facility in Brockville, Ontario, could adequately hold and rehabilitate Peter Woodcock. They wanted to pre prepare him for the outside world and eventually release him. Staff at Oak Ridge strongly advised against this again, detailing that he was still incredibly dangerous and a sexual deviant. He was transferred anyway. In Brockville, Peter Woodcock would be taken on trips to Ottawa and Montreal, and even to the movies to see The Silence of the Lambs. Y'all. During his stay at Brockville, Peter would once again revive the Brotherhood. This is where we enter Bruce Hamill. Peter met Bruce Hamill in 1978 when Bruce was sent to Oak Ridge. Bruce Hamill was born... November 27, 1956, with a front temporal lobe issue. Brain scans would show that his front temporal lobe was smaller than it should have been. Going back to the head injury thing. Oh my god, full circle. Bruce had behavioral problems all throughout adolescence and major anger problems in his teens and young adulthood. At 18, Bruce would join the militia, and when he came home, his violent rage had just gotten worse. He was impulsive and aggressive, and his family knew something was wrong, but constantly defended him. Bruce's mother, Gertrude, was a problem all in herself. Gertrude was a perpetual victim. The entire world was always out to get her, and it was always someone else's fault. She was overprotective of her problematic son, and even told him to stop taking his medication because it wasn't working. Bruce had been seeing a psychiatrist, and Gertrude told him to stop going because it was a waste of time. See, I was gonna say, like, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and like birds of a feather, but... <sighs> I don't know, it's hard to say, because look at the way Peter Woodcock ended up. And he, his foster mother, from three years old on, tried. Like, she really gave him love. Like, what, what would, what would Peter have been like had the Maynards not come into the picture? It would have been, like, it was bad already. Could we, good God. Bruce once got together with a homosexual friend of his. The pair would drink, smoke a little bit of the devil's lettuce, have a good time. But when Bruce's friend passed out, he would 
undress him and run a blade all over his naked body. He didn't kill him, but that's that's some problematic behavior right there. So it was shortly after Gertrude asked, or I guess told Bruce to stop seeing his psychiatrist that she called up her neighbor, Betty Wenslaff. Gertrude wanted Betty to sell her house to Gertrude's daughter because she like needed it more or something. I don't know. But when Betty Wenslaff obviously was like, no thanks, I don't really want to sell my house because that's kind of weird, Gertrude went off the deep end. She started hating Betty Wenslaff. Betty and her husband George had lived beside the Hamels for 21 years and were friends with them. They went out of their way to be friendly and cordial with the Hamels. On February 28, 1977, Mrs. Hamel called once again Betty Wenslaff and asked her to sell her house. When Betty said, no, I'm not going to, Mrs. Hamill starts yelling at this poor woman, saying she's being unreasonable and totally taking their friendship for granted. She hangs up and starts to cry. Bruce sees this, and it's at that point when he's seeing his mother crying, decides Betty Wenslaff needs to die. On February 1st, 1977, 58-year-old Betty Wenslaff left her house at about 5 a.m. to go to her part-time job at the school just behind her house as a custodian. In the darkness of the winter morning, Bruce followed her to work and attacked her just outside of the door of the school. Bruce stabbed Betty 27 times, leaving her to be found by the school's superintendent at 6.45 that morning. Police were baffled and there were no leads. Mrs. Wenslaff didn't have any enemies. Robbery was ruled out, and there was no physical evidence. I'm unsure of how they actually tracked Bruce down. They said that they'd knocked on absolutely every door, but two days later, Bruce was arrested, his house was searched, and they found the murder weapon. Bruce's trial began January 9th, 1978, and he, just as Peter Woodcock was, was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Bruce Hamill was sent to Oak Ridge, where he would meet Peter Woodcock. He would spend two years there, December of 1980, he would be transferred into Brockville, where he would spend three years, and by March of 1983, Bruce Hamill was a free man. Five years after Bruce was released, due to his not guilty charge, his criminal record was cleared. By 1988, Bruce Hamill was a murderer with no criminal record. So while Woodcock while Woodcock was trying to be rehabilitated in Brockville, he once again started the Brotherhood up. He had kept in contact with Hamill, who, although was free and criminal record free, was still obviously very mentally disturbed. And he worked as a security guard of all things. So like I said, when Peter got sent to, when Peter got sent to Brockville, he revived the Brotherhood, and Bruce Hamill was his first recruit. Peter told Bruce that the Brotherhood would help him with his brain damage. Uh, when Bruce was institutionalized, his father passed away, and Peter told him that he could help with the reincarnation of his father. And most importantly, Peter told Bruce that if he joined the Brotherhood, he had a spot on the spaceship set to leave in 2011 to their home planet. Bruce was already providing Peter all of the necessary things, companionship, sex, and most importantly, a link to the outside. Bruce would start visiting Peter in early 1991. During this time at Brockville, they had introduced a new day pass program, allowing patients off of hospital grounds with a sponsor or an escort, if you will. Sponsors were allowed to sign patients out on day trips, and the only stipulations of being a sponsor was you could not have a criminal record. Although staff at Brockville were familiar with Bruce Hamill, they had to treat him like anybody else because on paper, he was not a criminal. So, July 13th, 1991, Bruce Hamill would travel the one-hour train ride from Ottawa to Brockville. He made his first stop at a Canadian Tire to purchase a knife, a hatchet, and a sleeping bag. He would make his second stop at a drugstore to buy some sleeping pills, and he would arrive at Brockville just shortly after 2 p.m. 
Bruce was supposed to sign Peter out on two day passes that day. Once was One was just for the hospital grounds and one was for off hospital grounds. The pair were supposed to go to DQ, take a walk along the St. Lawrence River, grab a pizza from Swiss Chalet and come back to the hospital, eat it together and spend the night together. Instead, the pair would pick a spot, a secluded spot of shrubs, Uh, They would take the weapons that Hamill had brought and hide them along the trail. So the pair picks a spot, they hide their weapons, and they coincidentally run into just the person they're looking for, 27-year-old Dennis Kerr. Dennis is a patient at Oak Ridge, and he is under the impression that he is borrowing $500 from Peter. So they run into Dennis, Peter introduces Bruce and Dennis, and he tells them, excuse me, Peter tells Dennis, meet us back here. I just have to go get your money. Bruce and Peter then go sign out for Peter's second day pass off of hospital grounds. They go back to the shrubs. Peter hides in the bush and Bruce waits. Dennis approaches, asks Bruce, where is Peter? And at this point, Peter emerges from the bush with a pipe wrench that Bruce had brought and struck Dennis in the back of the head with it. Peter struck Dennis, and Dennis looked at him, and before he fell said, what did you do that for? And then he fell to the ground. Peter would then strike him again and sit by his dead body for an hour. After sitting beside Dennis's dead body for an hour, Peter and Bruce would then viciously attack his body, dissecting it, sexually assaulting him, sodomizing him, all while chanting ritualistically. After this ritual was complete, Hamill took his sleeping pills and fell asleep. When Bruce was asleep, Peter would take the sleeping bag he was sleeping in and pull it down, exposing his naked body. Peter would then take the knife that he had and run it along Bruce's abdomen and arms and... So after this, a nearly blind 52-year-old Peter Woodcock finds his way to the nearest police station five kilometers away using a pair of binoculars and a cane. Peter would turn himself in and take the police back to the scene of the crime. When they arrive, Bruce Hamill is naked and awake, flailing around being eaten by bugs. When the police arrived and Hamill saw them, he started to say things like, are you here to take me? I've done everything you want. I'm ready. Is your vehicle here? He really thought he was getting onto a spaceship to go to their home planet. Both men were obviously arrested and put into protective custody. Woodcock would masturbate in full view of the guards six times in the 10 hours that followed the crime. Their trial would begin December 9th, 1992, and both men were once again found not guilty by reason of insanity, and both were sentenced once again to Oak Ridge. Both men would be institutionalized until they die. Peter Woodcock would die on his 71st birthday, March 5th, 2010, and Bruce Hamill would live to 63, dying on May 21st, 2019. This case is just so fascinating it's so i i can't believe the layers that go into this and i really highly suggest that you read the books that i read um i did a lot of research for this case i read two books one is called the boy on the bicycle and the other one is called by reason of insanity um the boy on the bicycle is about the wrongful conviction of ronald moffat and by reason of insanity is obviously about the full life of peter woodcock slash david michael kruger both are very unbelievable unbelievably interest interesting reads i would highly suggest that you you read them this video is a total it's a reader's digest version There is so many, like I said, there's so many layers to this case and I could have gone on for hours and hours. Um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put some links underneath. Um, I just, I suggest that you do more reading into this case because I highlighted what I thought were the most important points. There's, there's a lot more and I'm not going to say you're going to understand it. But it just sheds some light. 
I appreciate you guys so much for being here. Thank you again. This was my first YouTube video. Um, it, this took me like two and a half hours to record. I don't know what, how editing is going to go, but it's all about the journey, right? So I don't really know how to end this. I don't really know how to open them. I don't really know how to end them. Whatever. Bye. <laughs> I will see you guys next time. Ah.